In March of 2021, a significant portion of global trade came to a halt when a cargo ship became stuck in the Suez Canal. Egypt was unsuccessful in getting the ship out alone. They needed help. But it wasn't the United States, China, Russia, or any other large or what would be considered a powerful nation or companies within them that would come to the rescue. An offer from the U.S. Navy to send dredging experts was accepted by Egypt, but this offer would become irrelevant. It was the Netherlands that saved the day. One powerful tugboat from the Netherlands and a second from Italy that was chartered by a Dutch company pulled the cargo ship out. A Dutch company, Royal Boscalis Westminster, led the operation. It may surprise many that this small nation would be the one to come to the rescue, but this story really isn't all that unique as far as help from the Netherlands goes. This was just one of the rare occurrences that the Netherlands actually received international attention for its inhabitants' unique abilities. The Netherlands is, in both the past and present, a master in both water management and trade, though in some ways they are connected in the Netherlands. To oversimplify, this is due to the Netherlands' geography. It's one of, if not the most flood-prone country in the world, or at least it would be if it wasn't for all of the innovative water management techniques that the country has come up with in order to survive. At the same time, because of its subpar geography, the country looked to the seas in order to prosper, eventually creating the largest company that ever existed, the Dutch East India Company, also known as the VOC. The VOC is long gone, but the Netherlands still plays a large role in international trade. In fact, they have the largest port in all of Europe, Rotterdam. Much of the imports are re-exported directly or after adding value. The ship stuck in the Suez Canal was actually headed to the port of Rotterdam. Its history of water problems that forced the country to develop water management skills and a knack for trade has predictably resulted in the country exporting skills related to large-scale water problems. Let's look at some more examples. We'll start with Egypt. The Suez Canal blockage was not the first time the Netherlands had provided their water-related services to Egypt. That same company, Boscalis, that led the operation had actually helped to widen the canal in 2014 and 2015. But the help goes back even further. Egypt requested Dutch expertise for its need to implement subsurface drainage on all agricultural land after the completion of the Aswan High Dam in 1970, which sparked the creation of what is called the Water Panel, where experts from both countries exchange ideas related to water. This panel still meets twice a year. In recent years, the panel has been researching and discussing ways Egypt can expand their agriculture and aquaculture using brackish water from underground aquifers, which approximately 55% of Egypt's area has access to. The Netherlands lies extremely low in elevation. It's basically one giant river delta. And with sea levels rising, the Netherlands has and will continue to be faced with rising salinity levels, which gives them experience in dealing with the issue and the motive to continue research and developing innovative methods of combating the problem, which can be used in other countries such as Egypt. In 2014, a Dutch team developed a potato through traditional breeding methods that is tolerant to salt water. Their project beat more than 500 competitors from 90 countries to win an award sponsored by the U.S. Agency for International Development. For Egypt, better utilizing its brackish water for things such as farming salt-tolerant crops or shrimp farms may soon be a necessity. Egypt faces fresh water supply issues due to a quickly rising population which is stretching the limits of their main water source, the Nile River. Egypt also believes that a newly built dam in Ethiopia on the Blue Nile, one of the two major tributaries of the Nile, could decrease the amount of water available. And as of now, 84% of Egypt's fresh water is used for agriculture, so using the brackish water for agriculture will certainly ease some of that strain. Now let's look at some projects in my country, the United States. In August of 2005, a destructive Category 5 hurricane named Katrina hit the city of New Orleans and the surrounding areas. Though it weakened to a Category 3 by landfall, it still resulted in 1,800 fatalities and $125 billion in damage. The city of New Orleans has many geographic similarities as the country of the Netherlands. It's a coastal city that sits low in elevation and on a river delta. Much of the city is actually below sea level. The city did have methods to prevent catastrophic flooding in 2005, but they were ineffective. The Dutch offered their assistance, and on September 7th, 
the U.S. government announced that it would accept the Dutch government's offer to send water pumps to deliver clean drinking water, five water management experts, and F-16s with sophisticated infrared cameras to look for weaknesses in the city's levees. The Netherlands help continued well after the disaster through the company Arcadis, a design and engineering firm with expertise in water management and flood protection. Arcadis has worked on numerous projects for the city of New Orleans, including what you see here. It's called the West Closure Complex, which is the largest drainage pump station in the nation. The facility has 11 specially designed pumps, each powered by a 5,400 horsepower diesel engine, each weighing 70 tons. The volume of water moved by one of these pumps could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool in less than five seconds, providing a significant first line of defense against hurricane storm surges. Hurricane Katrina also sparked a series of public meetings, focus groups, and consulting sessions that have taken place between civic leaders, stakeholders, and flooding experts from the U.S. and Netherlands, named the Dutch Dialogues. They began in New Orleans and now take place in other U.S. cities with water challenges, such as Norfolk, Virginia, and Charleston, South Carolina. These meetings in New Orleans sparked a proposed redesign of the city by a U.S. company called Wagner & Ball, which had not worked with water management before Katrina, but now its founder, David Wagner, and his firm are known for it. When the Dutch came to New Orleans, Wagner said that many of the Dutch asked, if this is a water city, where's the water? New Orleans has historically tried to hide the water underground versus a Dutch city where you can see the water all around. Some believed that New Orleans was denying the fact that it was a Delta city and it must embrace the water as part of the solution. Purely attempting to hold the water back was clearly not working. Wagner's firm, along with others from the Dutch Dialogues, formed a design team of more than 25 engineers, urban designers, landscape architects, city planners, and soil and hydrology experts from both the Netherlands and Louisiana. The team dedicated two years to developing what is called the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Plan, which is designed to be implemented over the course of 50 years. In 2015, it won the American Planning Association's National Planning Excellence Award for environmental planning. Now let's take a look at another U.S. city. This city used to belong to the Dutch. It was once called New Amsterdam, but today, New York City. Talks of improving New York's flood defenses were already underway, but in October of 2012, Hurricane Sandy hit the city of New York, resulting in $19 billion in damage and 43 deaths in the city. This hurricane ignited a sense of urgency. New York City needed better protection. Five different options were proposed, one of which included a swinging gate barrier similar to one in the Netherlands that would have stretched from Sandy Hook to Breezy Point, but at the cost of $119 billion and the chance that it would quickly become obsolete due to rising sea levels. It was decided that other smaller and less costly projects were the best option for the city. This includes a $5 to $10 billion project in Lower Manhattan, which was partially designed once again by Arcadis. The firm's design includes extending Lower Manhattan's shoreline up to 500 feet, or two full city blocks, and elevating the shoreline to be 20 feet or more above sea level. It's fitting that the Dutch company's focus is in Lower Manhattan, which was where New Amsterdam, the seat of government of the Dutch colony of New Netherland, was actually located. But the Dutch don't just prevent floods. They create land in the water where there is none, or had once been taken by the sea. And these practices are spreading to other countries as well. One of these projects is currently taking place in Singapore. These pieces of reclaimed land are called polders. They are created by first building dikes around a wetland. Water is then pumped out of the center. Historically, this was done with windmills. Today, this is done with electric pumps. Reeds are then sown. Today, this is done by aircraft. This helps the soil form. After three years, reeds are burnt and the ashes used as fertilizers for the soil. After a period of up to 15 years, the polder is ready for growing crops, building houses, and constructing roads. These polders are continually maintained to keep from becoming waterlogged from ground and rainwater. Water is pumped into canals or drained off through side gates. Singapore has already been reclaiming land for years, but this method will reduce its reliance on sand. The polder is being implemented at the northwestern end of Pulau Tekong, the second largest of Singapore's outlying islands. Its dike is designed against a 1 in 100,000 year wave overtopping, and the polder will add about 1% to Singapore's overall land size. 
There are hundreds, if not thousands, of other projects, large and small, that Dutch citizens have had significant roles in outside of their borders. I asked all of you in a community post for examples. Some of the other countries you mentioned that I haven't talked about so far in this video are Ireland, where merchants built much of the city of Cork by reclaiming land from marshland. The UAE, where Dutch companies constructed the Palm Islands. Russia, where off its coast, a Dutch company salvaged one of its nuclear submarines. Japan, where a Dutch company supplied fresh drinking water at the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, as they did in five prior Olympics. The list goes on. Italy, Bangladesh, Paraguay, Indonesia, Suriname. I wouldn't be surprised if there hasn't been a Dutch water project conducted in every country in the world. When researching for this video, I found there was often a lot of involvement in water-related projects and graduates from two universities in the Netherlands. One being Delft University of Technology, which is consistently ranked among the top 20 engineering and technology universities in the world. In the fields of civil and structural engineering, architecture, and mechanical engineering, they are consistently ranked in the top three in the world. The other is Wageningen University and Research, which is often ranked as number one in the world in agriculture and forestry and environment and ecology. Many classes, especially advanced degrees, are taught in English, which allows information disseminated and taught by these universities to be accessible to a wider audience outside of the Netherlands. I'm curious and excited to see what innovative water practices these Dutch universities and companies produce in the future. Before I end this video, thank you to all who left a comment on the community post asking for examples of Dutch water projects. Let us know of any other projects you know of that weren't mentioned in the video by leaving a comment here. And also, thank you to my few Patreon patrons for supporting my videos. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more geography related videos. Thank you for watching.